Jujutsu Kaisen just revealed the most broken power that even breaks the laws of physics. This ability rivals the likes of Satoru freaking Gojo and we have been waiting to see it in action for over 200 chapters. It's about term. This power will determine the fate of the entire Jujutsu Kaisen story we all love. And to make things even more insane, with the revelation of Kenjaku's domain, we have discovered the biggest secret ever regarding the nature of cursed energy, which you guys will only understand by the end of this video. So ladies and gentlemen, Yuki vs Kenjaku has begun and their mission to unseal Satoru Gojo relies on the outcome of this very Battle. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Everybody stay calm! Chapter 205 starts with Yuki saving Choso's ass before Kenjaku can finish his parental beating. Kenjaku's disappointment in his son is even greater than my dad when I told him I don't want to be a doctor. You go to Gubukan doctor! You go to doctor, yeah? Doctor! As Choso faints, Tengen opens up his barriers to retrieve him. He literally got the shit beaten out of him and it looked as if Kenjaku wasn't even trying. But through their fight, Kenjaku confirms Itadori's birth was intended for his role of being Sukuna's vessel. Back in chapter 143, we saw a flashback where it was revealed that Kenjaku was actually Itadori's mother. With his previous experiments in creating Choso and his brothers, Kenjaku was trying to create an upgraded hybrid between humans and cursed spirits. But he wasn't satisfied with the results. So can you thought? You know what? I'll just do it myself. And had actively taken part in, yeah, if you know what I mean, in birthing Yuji. Yep, he literally got pregnant and had a child just for the sole purpose in housing Sukuna many years down the line. Even Gojo had stated in the early chapters a vessel that could contain Sukuna without losing control was so rare that only once every thousand years or so does such a person exist. This tells us that Yuji is not human but a manufactured life form who is simply living as Kenjaku intended. I just can't do it. I can't now whilst our boy's woes is never ending, Brain Summer Kenjaku is on to his next plan, which is none other than capturing Tengen like she's a Pokemon. Due to evolving past her humanity because of not merging with a star plasma vessel 12 years ago, she in turn is kind of akin to a cursed spirit, hence a target of Ghetto's cursed spirit manipulation. Tengen even predicted that Kenjaku would come after her because he wants to forcefully merge her with the non-sorcerer population of Japan. Kenjaku explains in chapter 202 that this merger will mean a hundred million people will become more like cursed spirits with cursed energy. And as they all will be merged together, the collective will go through a distillation process, much like his Uzumaki technique. Remember, Uzumaki combines the cursed spirits the user has absorbed into one and unleashes a powerful attack of a super condensed cursed energy. And likewise, this merger will then produce a unique new form of cursed energy. Kenjaku wants to do all this just for the lols. Kenjaku's curiosity is his primary motive. He wants to know what this conglomeration of cursed energy would look like. He possibly could even then extract it using the Uzumaki technique. Either way, this merger would create unbridled chaos in the world. So saving Tengen is the only option for Yuki and Choso. Now our Tengen defense squad knew they would have to battle Kenjaku, whose full scale of abilities are still a mystery to them. However, Choso, even though he was told he would die against Kenjaku, stepped in to fight his daddy, all with the intention to uncover Kenjaku's other abilities. This would in turn give Yuki an early advantage where then she might be able to win. And luckily, Choso completed his mission by forcing Kenjaku to use something other than cursed spirit manipulation. But come
come on. <laughs> we were all thinking Choso was gonna die. So this was a big dub, especially for Yuki. Yuki pretty much confesses her interest in Choso, saying how much she loves rough and wild men. After all, Yuki was Todo's sensei, and from her interactions, we can see where Todo's personality developed. Like when Todo first met Yuki, her question was, what's your type? So it's pretty cool how Octomi incorporated this hair, especially when Yuki states that she will beat some sense into Kenjaku, making him her type. Damn! Now, Yuki and Kenjaku actually differs a lot from each other when it comes to their perspective on cursed energy. As we saw in chapter 136, Yuki wants to break free from cursed energy, whilst Kenjaku wants to optimize it. In simple words, Yuki wants people to be devoid of all cursed energy, being much like Toji or Maki, nipping the bud at the root by eliminating the very thing that can manifest cursed spirits. On the other hand, Kenjaku wants wants evolution and a world where everyone is a sorcerer with cursed energy and even a new form of it. Yuki argues that this world would be extremely chaotic but then again Kenjaku himself is a menace so he doesn't desire peace at all. This means that the result of this very battle can dictate a horrid dystopian future of the world even if Satoru freaking Gojo would ever get unsealed. But fear not because currently Kenjaku is at a huge disadvantage. Usually the higher ups have every little bit of detail on sorcerers, especially those the deem a threat like special grades. However, Kenjaku reveals that Yuki's curse technique is hidden even from them, so he has no way of knowing what to expect. Yuki on the other hand has a gist of what Kenjaku is capable of, so not taking any chances, Kenjaku steps back and summons one of his most powerful curse spirits right away. This elephant buddha looking spirit? is a special grade. Yuki points out that this curse is imported from Asia, which Kenjaku confirms it's none other than the curse of an Asian deity. Now we all predicted this as the design of this curse spirit is clearly inspired by the Hindu deity Ganesh or Vinaya. The curse spirit represents the fear of this deity. To further substantiate he's referring to Ganesh is when Kenjaku stated it can remove any obstacles. This is in line with Hindu mythology since Ganesh is called Vignahartha or the conqueror of obstacles. Hindus pray to Ganesh to remove obstacles on their path to success which is exactly what Kenjaku's cursed spirit does. Furthermore, Kenjaku claims that this cursed spirit's power can entangle concepts with his targets, implying that it removes whatever the user perceives as an obstacle at that moment. With this bad boy out, Kenjaku provokes Yuki to show him what she can do. Without wasting any time, the Shikigami floating snake looking thingy around Yuki turns into a ball. He calls it Garuda, which again aligns with Hindu mythology. Garuda is described as the king of the birds and a kite like figure, which explains why it's always hovering over Yuki like a kite. Is portrayed as a protector with the power to swiftly travel anywhere, ever vigilant and an enemy of every serpent, implying Kenjaku is the sneaky sly snake who has caused chaos in human history for the past 1000 years. Yuki channels her 2022 World Cup blue lock energy and boots it scoring a goal! Yuki just unlocked her inner monster guys. The god tier special grade curse spirit literally gets one shotted. Garuda rips right through this curse deity's face. What's more is that this might be a foreshadowing to Kenjaku's impending defeat. Because according to Hindu mythology, the presence of Ganesh is indispensable to a person's success. So even with or without Yuki's plan coming into fruition, Gojo being unsealed seems to be hinted more than ever. Remember, Itadori and Megumi also found Hana Kurosu who has the back door key to the prism realm. However, knowing Akutomi, Gojo being freed will coincide with the execution of either Kenjaku's or Sukuna's plan, giving us the final ultimate showdown. Coming back to the fight, Yuki gives no time for Kenjaku to respond as she closes the distance and clots him right for his arms to his face. Yuki has now just become my number one waifu. Like gosh damn. This right here is my favorite thing.
To add more salt to the wound, she mocks Kanjaku, acknowledging that she knew he wanted to keep a distance because, you know, he didn't know her curse technique. However, without giving any shits, she reveals it. Now, there actually might be a reason for doing this as revealing one secret or doing something like this might be considered as an equivalent exchange via a binding wow. By revealing your curse technique, you essentially eliminate the advantage of keeping your opponent in the dark while simultaneously making your technique stronger? There is kind of some logic to this, but what's more important is that her curse technique is none other than mask. What? Come on, I thought the name was self-explanatory. But now we know why she's considered a special grade. Because she can add mass to herself even beyond comprehension of normal physics. Let me break down how OP this is with my anime bullshit science. Firstly, you have to understand that mass and weight are two different things. Mass is the amount of matter in an object, whilst weight is the force due to the pull of gravity on the said object. So no matter where you are in space, your mass will be the same. Whereas your weight can change depending on the gravitational pull you experience. Yuki using her curse technique increased her overall mass before landing the hit. This in turn generated a ridiculous amount of force. If Yuki is able to add infinite mass onto herself, the force she can produce would also respectively increase infinitely. This is exactly what Kenjaku notes as Yuki's punch was so powerful that the airtight barrier, Tengen space-time fabric itself, was torn open by the sheer force. Kenjaku explains that this curse technique's concept is even more ridiculous as the amount of mass applied is something that can't even be comprehended or contained by the concept's definition and semantics. Yuki gives an insight that this is not simply an addition of mass, rather her curse technique is to add imaginary mass. This is more broken than it sounds. The name of this curse technique is Bombaye and the kanji spells out Wrath of the Stars or Stars Wrath which both are very fitting, especially due to the immense weight a star can come up to. Let's not forget that black holes are literally a star collapsing on itself. And Yuki can apply her insane imaginary mass to not only herself, but also her Shikigami Guruda, in effect turning it into a cursed tool. No wonder it was able to one-shot the special grade spirit right through its face. This application of imaginary mass doesn't even have any real effect on its target, cause you know, it's imaginary. So any weight or cell acceleration doesn't decrease. Kenjaku straight up states that Yuki is ignoring the laws and concept of physics and due to that he can't use any of his high ranked curse spirits. Meaning somehow on his own he has to beat this beast. But this task ain't impossible. As the previous chapter already hinted at with Joso's role in the battle, Kenjaku has more than curse spirit manipulation in his bag of curse techniques. So far we were certain that he has curse spirit manipulation and brain hopping but now we also know he can use reverse curse technique. Yes, our stitch headed boy flexed his reverse curse technique by literally regrowing his entire arm. Like gosh dang, that actually gave me hope for Todo and Inomaki. But Tengen, Yuki and Choso were actually trying to gauge the true extent of Kenjaku's powers and Choso's fight also exposed his massive secret which is Kenjaku's third curse technique is actually gravity. That's right, going back to Kenjaku's fight with Choso in the last chapter, we see that our boy managed to break through his cool demeanor and forced him to use another technique to avoid getting hit by blood manipulation's attack. Kenjaku destroyed the area around him with sheer force as a counterattack against the compressed blood, showing us all that he had used gravity. That's very How original, original. by Akutami. It's, it's not a shonen story without a user of gravity, is it? And well, every anime has it for a reason as this is such a goaded power and we already know now Kenjaku is shrewdly adept at using the means at his disposal. Moreover gravity is just broken especially against Yuki who's using mass as her weapon. This can give Kenjaku a major advantage since he can manipulate the gravitational field around him and weaponize the most harmless things like concrete pieces as well. But there is another huge revelation that just is tanked Kenjaku. What do you mean by that? We know with Kenjaku's hostile takeover of Geto's body, he got lifetime access to the broken technique of cursed spirit.
spirit manipulation. But unlike Geto, Kenjaku was aware of just how strategically advantageous the maximum Uzumaki of this technique is. Back in the Cullen game, we know Kenjaku consumed Mahito and extracted Ideal Transfiguration using Uzumaki and used it to kick off the Cullen game. At that point, we all thought that Kenjaku acquired another curse technique that could turn people into pulp with a touch. Literally. I know what you're thinking. Anyway, Kenjaku did not use this technique after that, even against Choso, making us wonder why exactly was he holding back? Because he's surely not the type to do so. I mean, Choso's death was practically guaranteed with Hydral Transfiguration. So what What's was up? On? Was Kenjaku what finally mending What's his ways on? as a dad? Sadly not. Because in this chapter, Yuki just concluded that Kenjaku can in fact use the techniques extracted from Uzumaki only once. What? This has major implications for the power scaling because Kenjaku already used his one-time trump card with Ideal Transfiguration and without it, he is way less OP than we thought him to be. Well, by special grade level though, Kenjaku is still a monster compared to normal sorcerers. Yuki also thinks that it is impossible for Kenjaku to store multiple techniques from Uzumaki because it would fry his brain, which is basically his entire body. Moreover, according to Yuki, if one does not have external storage like Yuta, the brain's memory will blow away and not in a good way. People who have our notification all already know from this video that Yuta can copy a ton of cursed techniques and sort of dump them all into Rika and to select one to use at a time. But if that's the case, how does Kenjaku have four techniques? Does he also have an external storage like Rika? In the fan book, Akutami clearly mentioned that Kenjaku should only have two curse techniques, one of his own and another of the host, which means there's Wait more at play here than Sorry, we're seeing. The brain is the key to it all because it seems manipulated like, just look at this dude, he the, the, the brain has teeth, it has freaking teeth! You can't tell me this, this is, is normal. normal. There is something up with this brain. So, there is a high chance that Yuki's estimation is somewhat wrong and Kenjaku's brain doesn't work the same way as a normal brain does. Like, what if this shit is actually like Frankenstein's monster? I wouldn't put it past him to experiment on himself given his history with Choso and his brothers as well as Itatori. Anyway, all this time, Kenjaku was also trying to understand Yuki's ability because he couldn't find any information on her technique. But he was confident that since she is a special grade sorcerer, there was more to her than just being a bowling prodigy. He believes that she has a hidden trump ability, an extension of her technique with a large curse energy output. Clearly, it's a stalemate between them, and you and I both know the rules of Jujutsu Fight Club of settling stalemates. Curse at each other. No, no, no. I, I mean, use the ultimate card, domain expansion. Yuki for real making Kenjaku shit his pants right now, bro. This is about to be lit. Well, Kenjaku bets on the fact that Yuki wasn't sure she would win a domain expansion battle since she didn't use her domain in a situation where neither of them knew each other's technique properly. Knowing Kenjaku, he wouldn't have used his domain if he wasn't backed into a corner and Yuki wanted to do exactly that. Her plan with Tengen was to chip away at Kenjaku's strength and force him into using a domain expansion that wouldn't be at 100% power. And once he was done with his domain, he would be in a situation to not use his curse techniques as easily. Yuki had to take the risk that she would be rendered in the same condition as well while relying on Garud as her advantage. Both Yuki and Kenjaku know how crucial this battle is, and with no more options left against Yuki's OP curse technique, Kenjaku had to bring out his domain, all-encompassing Garvadatu, or the Womb Realm. And of course, in the classic Akutami style, this domain and even its hand sign are loaded with Buddhist and Hindu mythological references. Kenjaku's domain hand sign is different from all the other ones we have seen before as his palms are facing outward like it's an inverted mudra. Yup, we found what Kenjaku's inverted mudra could mean so you won't have to. It seems like the inverted form of the seal represented by the 11-faced Kanon Bodhisattva or the Ekadas Mukha. In Buddhism, a Bodhisattva is a person who has reached enlightenment but has put off going to paradise in order to help other people achieve enlightenment. 
The people who have our notification bell on know from this video that enlightenment is the very important element of Jujutsu Kaisen's story and enlightened sorcerers are the strongest. So don't be a silly willy and hit that bell icon now to never miss an upload like that. Bodhisattva's definition doesn't quite apply to Kenjaku. In fact, just like his inverted mudra, Kenjaku is leading people away from enlightenment and into samsara, which is also seen as pain and suffering in Buddhism. Essentially, Kenjaku's entire character is the opposite of a bodhisattva because he desires chaos instead of peace and suffering instead of nirvana. Avalokitesvara, the primary form of this bodhisattva, vowed to never rest until he had freed all sentient beings from samsara. Kenjaku is actually leading people to death while he is jumping from body to body as a brain to prolong his own life for a thousand years. And if you're still not convinced, look no further than the 11-faced Kanon. While this might be a hint to how Kenjaku might have already possessed 11 people in his long life, including Geto, Naruto Shikamo, and Idatori's mother, there are more hints that Kenjaku Kenjaku is Akutomi's subversion at play. Let's begin with this latest addition, a cursed spirit that we discussed earlier. Ekata Smuka himself is also very closely associated with the elephant-headed god Ganesh or Vinayak. A version of this story states that the Bodhisattva embraced Vinayak, who achieved great bliss and abandoned his evil ways. While Geto using cursed spirit manipulation before his betrayal was similar to Bodhisattva's tale, Kenjaku is the opposite. As a cursed spirit under Kenjaku's control, the story goes entirely the other way, feeding the evil. Moreover, the 11 heads of Ikada's Muk represent the 11 types of ignorance that plague sentient beings and are removed by the Bodhisattva. We know that Kenjaku is the furthest person from ignorance because he has a millennium's worth of knowledge about the Jujutsu world that he uses in his grand plan. In fact, his goal with the Culling Games is to get rid of his own lack of knowledge about the infinite possibilities regarding curse energy. It's safe to say Kenjaku despises being ignorant to the point that his curiosity is the manifestation of his inner evil. There is no morality in his actions in the pursuit of answers. Coming back to Kenjaku's domain expansion, Mansion, this is one hell of an eerie one with faceless pregnant women adorning whatever this is. What, what is bruh. It reminds me a lot of Mononoke or Vengeful Spirits from Japanese mythology. The domain expansion's name makes all the more sense now. Womb Realm is actually an abstract concept in Buddhism that represents a space where five Buddhas of compassion reside and is best portrayed as a mundle. This mundle also represents five types of wisdom and the central Buddha is always Dainichi Nyorai who represents the wisdom to surpass ignorance, connecting back to Kenji Kenjaku's aversion to ignorance. What's more is that Kenjaku's name refers to a whip used by two figures in Buddhism. One being Guanyin, who is the Buddha of compassion and is sometimes depicted on the womb world Mundo as well. This also refers back to the 11-headed Kanon, who is the Bodhisattva of compassion. But well, <laughs> we know Kenjaku has no compassion at all, making him the antithesis of all the references from Buddhism. So there is no doubt that this is a dangerous domain expansion from the name itself, but, but we don't know which curse technique of his the womb realm belongs to. Regardless, it seems like Kenjaku took Yuki by surprise, but worry not, our dear Granny Tengen has made her way to the arena fine. And guess what, she is all about going big or going home, because her first attack is her own domain expansion to counter Kenjaku. We have not witnessed a domain battle in such a long time, and yes, I'm sure we all still resent Akutami for baiting us with a three-way domain battle back in chapter 179, so this is gonna be freaking incredible. And yes, even Tengen's domain expansion hand sign is a reference to another Maitreya, who is one of the three most spiritually gifted bodhisattvas, which also includes Ekadasmuk. So if you want to watch us go balls deep into Akatami's big brain references for Tengen, make sure to hit that notification bell because we had to bring out the freaking Vedas for this man. Holy shit. Also, while you're at it, watch this video about Gojo.